This is Euler's famous identity, and you might wonder, how might one arrive at this identity? Well, in this video, you'll see how we can use Taylor expansions to derive this formula. So we're going to derive this identity using Taylor polynomials. So this is Taylor's formula, and it allows us to expand non-polynomial functions as infinite polynomials, and specifically for those centered at zero, we call them Maclaurin polynomials. We're going to start by finding the Maclaurin polynomial of sine of x, which using Taylor's formula, the approximation will start at f of zero, which is just the sine of zero, which is just zero. So there's your first term. Then the first derivative at zero, which is just the cosine of zero, and that's one. So there's your slope of the tangent line for that particular time. At f double prime of zero, we have negative sine of zero, which is just zero. So that term will just go away f triple prime of zero, which is negative cosine of zero, which is negative one. And hopefully by the time you reach this particular derivative, you see that there's going to be a pattern with every other derivative that has sine is just going to cancel out because the sine of zero, no matter multiply with whatever, is just going to be zero. And you'll notice that the functions only leave the odd powered terms, which is kind of interesting because sine is an odd function. And of course the approximation gets better and better as you go with more and more terms. Same thing, we're going to find the Maclaurin polynomial for cosine x as our next step in showcasing Euler's identity, derived through Taylor's expansion, of course. So we start at f of 0 again, but this time it's the cosine of 0, so it starts at 1. The second term will just be the f prime of 0, which is just negative sine of 0. Negative sine is the derivative of cosine goes away of course and hopefully you notice that there's going to be that same exact pattern with the sine terms of the derivatives being completely erased due to the fact that sine of zero is zero and something interesting to note here is that in this case unlike sine which kept the odd polynomial terms this one keeps the even ones and cosine is an even function so maybe there's a correlation there that might be interesting for you to figure out on your own. And of course, the approximation, once again, gets better and better over time. So keep in mind what those two approximations look like. And last but not least, we'll approximate e to the x as a Taylor polynomial, writing out just a few terms. And luckily, this is easier because the derivative of e to the x will always be e to the x, no matter how many times you differentiate it. So. At zero, it'll always be one. So this makes applying Taylor's formula very easy. So your first term will just be f of zero, which is just one. Your second term will also have an f of zero term, which is just x. Second and third and fourth and fifth term, hopefully you notice a pattern, x squared over two, x cubed over three factorial, on and on and on. And you see on the left, a visual representation of the approximation. Now, what we're going to do is apply that Taylor formula for e to the x, but we're going to put a constant before it. So let's say k, and you can check it out that when you do a Taylor expansion with a constant in front, you'll actually notice that it's just going to be the e to the x Taylor polynomial just with a k in front of the x. So this is actually your Taylor expansion. Now let's input the imaginary unit i into this. And remember that i is just one i, i squared is negative one, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is one. And this will repeat for every four terms of i, or every i to the power. And of course we can now, using that logic, we can simplify this expansion a little bit. Now we're going to separate the odd powers and the even power terms into two parentheses bracket terms. And we'll notice that when we factor out an i, we end up with the Taylor expansions for cosine and sine. So in fact, e to the i x is just cosine x plus i sine x. We can also derive pi using similar ideas. So let's let arctan equal the integral of one over one plus x squared. Let's rewrite it in a very specific way 
where we can write this as a sum of a geometric series. On the description, I'll let you know how that's possible. Now, we're going to rewrite this integral, and we can switch the integral and summation signs, bring that negative 1 to the n out, because that's just a constant. And then we can use the reverse power rule to solve that, and now we have this new summation approximation for arc 10 of x, and it's actually a Taylor polynomial. So there you have first for terms, and when we put in 1, remember arc 10 of 1 is pi over 4, we get this sum of fractions, which is alternating, and all we have to do now is multiply both sides by 4, and we have pi as this alternating sum of fractions, which is just this new summation that you'll, you'll see on the screen right now. So there you have it. We derived Euler's identity and pi using the concept of Taylor series polynomials. Now I want to leave you with something really brilliant. Now the derivation of pi was cool, but we're actually going to use pi in Euler's identity. In, th in fact, we're going to plug pi in for x. And now we're going to see something very fascinating. In fact, when we simplify this equation and we move all the terms to the left-hand side with zero being on the right, we actually get this equation. Euler's formula gives us a brand new equation combining five of the most important numbers in math. We have e, i, pi, one, and zero. And hopefully this leaves you with a bit of fascination for how mathematics is interconnected.